Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition. It is the 20th of November, 2019. As always, I want to thank my supporters, my donors uh, especially, and um, I need to remind everybody that um, I'm always in desperate need of, of, of funds. And the thing is that though that money goes to is, as many of you know, two new books, Ukrainian Nationalism, this is published um, in part with the assistance of uh, Russia Insider, and um, The Soviet Experiment by the Barnes Review um, a few months ago. So I work very hard, um, and I work alone. Well, I have I have uh, cats, but they are uh, not the research assistants that, that you might think they are. Um, but speaking of research, uh, I want to talk about something today that might irritate some of my, my friends. Not many of them, but some of them. The title of the paper is the Plague of Well-Meaning Dabblers, the Flat Earth, Apologue, and the Decay of Postmodern Science. The word apologue doesn't get used very much. It refers to a story, um, not quite a fable, but a story that has a, a moral purpose with very exaggerated details, details that either are just irrelevant or, or, or almost comic, but it has a broader purpose, usually a moral purpose. And this isn't necessarily about the flat earth as such, a, um, an idea that I, I dismiss with a wave of my hand, but the foundation of where this came from. I, every once in a while I get a meme on Facebook and it says that Every country in the world, but I think it says Syria, Iran, and China, I think, North Korea, has a Rothschild-owned central bank. And every time I see this, I respond to it. And I say, there are many countries that have a state-owned central bank. Several dozen, in fact. But it continues to make the, make the rounds. And it's just these these um, these emotional investments that people that people put into this. And this is is on the hard sciences today something in which I, I have no acumen really. But the hard sciences are very politicized. Now I do know quite a bit about the history and philosophy of science. But as I've said before, you know, fields like biology or international political economy have a few things in common, and, and, and they're technical fields. They have a specialized vocabulary, they have seminal texts, they have intellectual factions, they have unmentionable opinions, competing theories, they have biases, and they have journals. And to get a grasp on them, it requires many years of, of study. The notion of, of ever-changing truths is a problem, because if truths are relative and ever-changing, then why ever, why work? Why become an expert in anything? Why, why become a, a scientist or a historian? And what would, what would expertise even mean if truth is ever changing and, and, and is unreachable, as so many have said? But if truth isn't discernible anyway, then why bother? Why, why do the work? And because of this assumption that truth is fluid, the will to power is all that exists, this is the rise of the amateurs. And, and amateurs with a capital A. I don't mean any non-professional who gets into the field. Sometimes they can do good work. That's not what I mean. The amateur is, is something else altogether. Now, science is one thing, but the philosophy and theory of science is another. The scientific practitioners often don't know very much about the theories that underwrite their, their observations. People look at science as this, um, like a group of, of Spock-like geniuses. That they're searching for rational explanations to unknown phenomena, you know. And the truth is, is that generally speaking, they're self-interested, bureaucratic mediocrities, and they're working for profit-seeking corporations. 
The word science itself is a mystification. There is only a scientific establishment. Now, the amateur is often well-meaning, but not always. The amateur is someone who is angry that those who are charged to do a certain intellectual task, journalists or professors, have failed. The amateur is, has some education, but he's driven largely by emotion and a very strong sense of injustice. And he's often responding to real problems, real problems that the academic world refuses to address. They attempt to restate every theory that they come across in simple kind of real-world terms that they can grasp, and then use that as their starting point, which is a, an old pet peeve of mine. But he's needed. In medicine, for example, the amateur is a check on the, the arrogance of, of the AMA. You know, I've said this before, the, the long march of the right wing, uh, sorry, the left wing through the institutions, the purge the right wing, and this is, you know, I think I went through this several weeks ago, uh, this, this part of the essay here. That the amateur, you know, unfortunately still has um, a skin-deep knowledge. Not because they're not intelligent, but often because they don't know where to go for information. You have a lot of people, very intelligent people who I respect, who think that going to the press, to the media, and books published by the major presses, is the same thing as becoming knowledgeable about these fields. That's like watching Rambo for an education about the Vietnam War. You know, it's ridiculous. That's not the job of these people. It should be. Their job is to entertain, to promote the agenda, and to satisfy advertisers, among other people. Now, the amateur at his best is a court jester. They mock the pretensions of the elites in, in all these different fields. That's something that, that I've... I've been through before, and it's, it's extremely important to me. I'm not making fun or or attacking the amateur at all. Amateurs are my friends and supporters. Socrates, of course, the ultimate amateur. I do, however, go after people who, without the requisite knowledge and, and methodological experience, claim expertise in a technical field. That I have a problem with. Because often these guys know just enough to sound like they have authority. And when a young person comes across them, they could poison them forever. Um, there's some of these, you know, constitutionalist patriots who have no idea that Patrick Henry refused to sign the Constitution. They use phrases like the founding father, like that's a meaningful phrase. You know, it, it, it bothers me. Now I've, so again, so on the one hand, the amateur intellectual has, has, has a role. And it's to, to mock the pretensions of the academics and everything else. That, in that area, I've seen them go up against IRS agents and rip them to pieces. They're the ones who are going up against the pharmaceutical companies and ripping them. It, it's really wonderful to behold. They're the ones who are, um, leading the charge against the 5G. Um, EMF stuff. And they're making great headway. As you know, I believe that's, that's banned in Russia as it stands now. But that's not the same thing as claiming medical expertise or scientific expertise or expertise in electromagnetic fields. There are problems with this. And, and we're talking about the flat earth concept as being one of the most Bizarre manifestations of this. And I, I have a list of things that are problematic with the amateur. That is to say, someone who's claiming to be a professional or some, someone who's claiming to be an expert. Not, not someone who, you know, has an interest in an issue who wants to, you know, um, uh, protect their family. That's, that's not what I mean. People who claim technical expertise when well, they don't have it. And there's a few things that I've discovered. Um, the equivocal use of terms, conflating the technical and conversational use of words, is very, very, very important. And that's one that you see all the time. 
conflating truth with emotional investment is another. For historians, importing modern concepts and priorities onto much older and foreign society, turning history into either an action movie or a melodrama is a big one. The refusal to, to provide a context for anything, the constant use of the passive voice, you know, phrases like, Hitler came to power and began killing people. Attempting to read minds. Like, um, like, you know, she killed him due to jealousy. Or Napoleon was motivated by his short stature. Or Hitler killed Jews because he was a failed artist. The notion that there's psychologists all of a sudden who could read their minds and know what their motivations are. Every bad argument often starts with a claim to mind reading. The only way you could know motivations if they say so, or if it's so blatantly obvious and clear, especially financial motivations, that's one thing. We've all heard the Hitler stuff, you know. His mother died in the, in the, at the hands of a Jewish doctor, therefore, you know, this sort of nonsense. And you, and you see this in professionals as well as um, amateurs in, 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 in history. The history buff, as you know, is often a joke. These are the suburban guys who collect Civil War books. And again, when our people do it, it's different because they're fighting a war. When the average neocon does it, he's a problem. Uh, our people are a different story. It, it's, it's not in our interest to support this stuff, but we do it anyway. For these people, they want to make sure that they're absolutely harmless. The omnipresent confirmation bias and cherry picking, uh, jumping to conclusions, the regular use of cliches and arguments from authority uh, is another. A, a confusing logical entailment in empirical generalization is a big one. Not because I could, I could gather a conclusion from data, therefore there's a logical entailment. Personalizing arguments is another one. I see that professors do this all the time. You know, Christianity is my God, not just, you know, they can't control their emotions. The regular implicit appeal to conventional wisdom. Um, which is similar to, to ad hominem. If you've been in Facebook debates, you'll, you'll hear people cite, you know, the New York Times as if it's an authoritative newspaper. And it is not. It's just because they have more money and are more powerful. Therefore, they must be correct. The inability to distinguish authority from power. And this is something that, that great historians have done. Eric Vogel and Leo Strauss, Toynbee. These sweeping generalizations about an entire civilization. Well, so I love Eric Vogel and I've learned a lot from him. You can't make sweeping generalizations about an entire civilization. Now, the Romans were a stoic people. Something like that. Confusing social forces with people. So if you oppose the homosexual agenda, you therefore hate gay people. It's almost impossible to argue with someone who thinks like this. But they don't know the difference between a social force, like a, a, a movement, you know, a homosexual or something like that, a movement of some type, with individuals who are members, even, even on the fringes, means that they have just no intellectual capacity at all. You could say that, that blacks are, or the, or non-whites are the cause of, of crime, violent crime in this country, which for the most part is true, way out of proportion to their numbers. Therefore, my black friends from high school and college, I, I must hate them. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't follow. You're a national socialist. Therefore, you hate your Jewish dentist down the street. I'm not talking about individuals. We're talking about groups. Giving labels a life of their own. Um, so they, they, they label someone a fascist. They have some emotional conception of what that might be. So then they'll anticipate that person uh, to have all the positions and, on political topics that will derive from their own stereotype of what a fascist might, might think. Susceptibility to the framing effect. That is, a position is accepted or rejected based on how it's presented. 
the inability to take their own biases into consideration. You know, one of the things that really, I'm giving away some power here, but one of the things that will really get me fuming is to claim that I have a, an emotional connection to a position and therefore I can't see a bias. If these people knew what I went through to develop the positions that I have, the suffering, the lost friends, the lost money, the lost jobs, the struggles, not even you know, the purely intellectual struggles, having a reading ridiculous amounts of material because I wasn't satisfied with one, you know, I get angry when someone says that. But but a but an amateur often can't tell the difference, and they think that that my approach is the same as theirs. So if they're driven by emotion, I must be too. Um, reducing a tremendous thinker to a few words. Someone said recently, um, Aristotle reduced morality to a mean between two extremes. Something stupid like that. They take Aristotle to, you know, and, and reduce him to two or three words. And then reducing arguments to a common, uh, usually a business related cliche. Then using that as their, as their, um, starting point. So in the debates about philatism that I've been, ha- that I have, I've had over the years, they dismiss everything I say about, you know, the, the Balkan bishops being uh, bought and sold, which of course was policy, it was Turkish Empire policy. And they say, well, the church, you know, he's reducing the church to just a business expense, and we can't accept that. Well, that's not what I said. But they take a complicated position, reduce it to some very simple idea that they can understand, and that becomes uh, the straw man that they then attack. Now, like everything else, um, things like space travel and astrophysics, these are highly uh, politicized. Um, I am an amateur when approaching those topics. I know very little about physics. The difference between something like physics and history as technical fields is that historians and, and lawyers is another one, um, political science, all this, we use words that you hear in general conversation, but we use them in a very different way. There's a technical definition, and then there's a conversational definition. Usually in the hard sciences, like physics and, and biology, they have their own vocabulary entirely, usually based on the Greek. So no one knows, no one knows what they're talking about. So an amateur will approach that with far greater trepidation than they would history or economics. Because our language uses words that we use every day in conversation. What they don't know is that we don't mean them in the same way as we would in just day-to-day life. So I want to not fall into my own anathema here. Um, but I am a historian of science. And um, so I want to, you know, if I'm going to approach something in which I'm an amateur... I'm, I'm at least knowledgeable about that, and um, um, and do it in, in in the Socratic kind of a way. Now it wasn't that long ago. I was um, at a Fourth of July party in Altoona, Pennsylvania, and I heard somebody say, um, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but we now know that there are billions and billions of galaxies out there. And therefore, the odds favor that they must have intelligent life somewhere. Billions and billions of galaxies. We all know this. They, they, use, they use the first-person plural, you know, we. Now, for a society that's rejected God and his church, by and large, science fiction becomes a semi-religion. The general claim that the universe is infinite and billions of solar systems and galaxies must exist um, is is common. Now, that is not, and this is something I can talk about, that is not um, an empirical claim. 
know, I wish, I wish people in their field would have, would be this careful about making statements in my field. First of all, you could say to these people that infinity is not a term scientists are allowed to use. It's not an observable or measurable property. The probable existence of billions of galaxies, too, is comically beyond empirical replication. No one's ever seen these galaxies. But method doesn't exactly make a dent in these, in these speculations. We all remember as kids, high school, and before those, before then, seeing in these textbooks these pictures of these beautiful colored galaxies and star clusters, at purple and, and, and green, and these, they're, they're swirling, beautiful things. And most of us grew up believing that's what they actually look like. And you see them in every astronomy textbook. I saw them even as a, as a little kid. They don't look like that. Those are artists' renditions. NASA will tell you that these are computer-generated simulations of what might be out there. And yet, educated people, myself included, you know, 10 years ago, thought that that's what they actually looked like. Somehow, they got close enough, light years away, to take a picture of this galaxy, and it just so happens to look like this absolutely beautiful, uh, uh, swirling, colored um, kaleidoscope. You don't need to be a scientist to know that nothing can get through the Van Allen belts, which is something that I came across only because I was reading in Russian that the reason that the Russ, the Soviet program never went to the moon is because um, the Soviet establishment said they would have to build a shuttle or a craft about a foot thick of lead for it to get through these Van Allen belts. You know, very few people know what NASA does. It is based on a deeply philosophical, even theological conception. NASA scientists have said numerous times, without realizing it, uh, one quote I've seen, and I will get to this in a minute, when we figure out how to penetrate these belts, we can start working on a manned Mars mission. I've seen that several times. I don't think these guys realize well, that means that no one's gotten to the moon yet. No one's quite sure what these people do. Can you think of one thing that's been gained by the billions of dollars spent by NASA? Our oceans are probably less explored than outer space, but there's no agency do doing that. I would say that the payoff in plumbing the depths of the oceans which are almost completely unknown, are greater than that of outer space. But space exploration is driven by science fiction and political ideology. Now, if you could, maybe you could, you could show me where I'm wrong. I'm willing to listen here. But I'm pretty sure NASA has produced nothing of value. In 2019, NASA gets about $21 billion. Now, since 1970, their percentage of the budget has declined. It used to be about 4.5% 4, 4 in 1965 to 0.3% just a few years ago. That means they're worried. They have to maintain public interest in various ways or else they're in trouble. So hoaxes are irresistible. You know, men will lie when their livelihood is at stake, and it's hard to blame them for it. Now, um... There's a positivist and nominalist axiom in modern science. And the main one is, which is reasonable, that cause and effect, and that alone, and therefore a material cause and effect, that's the domain of science. Outside of that, science should shut its mouth. It has nothing to say if it isn't based on material cause. They can't assume something is just cause. Unless it's observable, they can't talk about it. So that eliminates the human mind, not the brain, the mind, the spirit, free will, the Big Bang, billions of galaxies, or moral theory. Among other things, those things are eliminated. Science can have no opinion about free will because by definition it's not caused directly by a material force. They can't deny it, they can't affirm it, they can't talk about it, yet they mouth off about it all the time.
Now, the person making, when I, when I heard, um, that comment about the galaxies, I wasn't sure what to do about it because he sounded intelligent. He was a nice man. But I did read the paper, um, imaging, uh, photometry and spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopy, the primary tools of astronomy. Uh, I'll learn to pronounce that eventually. Um, and they say this, they say electric light detectors, like charge coupled devices or CCDs for short, have now displaced photographic materials at most ast- astronomical observatories. These detectors produce data that can be recorded digitally and entered directly into a computer for processing and analysis. Am I worried about that? Because it means that direct observation is impossible. So the universe, so to speak, is mapped using assumptions about how light and heat operate in a vacuum of space. The alleged existence of the most ancient stars always had to deal with the source of the fuel. The black hole was invented to deal with that question. That's what it exists for. It's the source of fuel for these massive ancient structures. No one's ever seen a black hole by definition. Things like neuron stars or black holes, dark matter, these are imaginary concepts. No one has ever seen but they have to exist in order for other things to work out. How many people can challenge that at a professional level? I can't. I can only ask unpleasant questions. But when it comes to observing space, I was taken by the fact when I found out that those pictures that I grew up seeing were false. In other words, they were generated. Um, And from the same paper, thermal infrared images are detector and lens combinations that give visual representation of infrared energy emitted by all objects above zero K. In other words, thermal images let you see heat. Depending on the sophistication of your system, uh, heat imaging, that is, is capable of providing very detailed images of situations invisible to the naked eye. Thermal images cannot see through walls, although you can gather much information about the inside of the wall as well as what's happening on the other side. You would also be able to see things like studs inside the wall or damaged installation and roofing applications. We hope that this dispels a few of the most common myths regarding infrared energy. Thermal imager, imagers in Hollywood in real life are very different. Now, that's one foundation for the billions of galaxies idea. It doesn't have roots in observation. I remember very well from my astronomy uh, courses in college. And by the way, one of my favorite classes that the claim is that the most incredibly faint hints of interstellar heat are picked up by these imagers. But I don't know how this could be done over light years. That escapes me. And these extremely, almost impossibly minute data points are plugged into the imagery program that then creates these pictures of galaxies billions of light years away. And I can't help but answer the question, are these connected with NASA's worry to worry about his budget? I've heard too many scientists now saying that the Hubble telescope can't see any farther than ground-based telescopes. The Space Observatory admits this. I remember when when it was launched, it was going to open up the universe. No one can photograph and record with, with sensitive recording equipment. Stars and galaxies light years away, giving us the faintest radiation. To accurately determine the size, shape, temperature, orbit, etc. of these entities. Well, the telescope moves around the Earth's orbit at 17,000 miles an hour. At, by the way, very extreme temperatures. The Infrared Space Observatory admits that the most distant universe is obscured by massive clouds of ice. At absolute zero, almost. So nothing can really be seen anyway. So as these things are more distant, they can't be observed. They're surrounded by clouds. As I mentioned, radiation, massive amounts of radiation, besides them being light years away. So the infrared technology maps these by measuring both light and heat somehow. So the imaging maps are from an artist's imagination. They use present theoretical models of the universe without empirical foundation, and they'll tell you what's really out there. Now, I don't know how water can be discovered billions of light years behind impenetrable clouds. How could this possibly be known? It comes down to extrapolations from extrapolations, resting on modern theory. 
The virtual world that NASA, uh, NASA's computers have created is considered the real one. This is Johnson's law at its most extreme. So long as it conforms to the basis, the ideological basis of the discipline. It's science fiction. And I wasn't surprised when I connected this to the Kabbalah. Now I'm in more comfortable territory. Gerald Lawrence Schroeder, the physicist um, at MIT, was at MIT in the U.S. Atomic Energy Committee, was a follower of Lurie and the Kabbalah. He says this. He's talking about the Big Bang. Um, he says, Now, Kamaiides, the Kabbalist, says that, all, that although the days, that is the days of creation in Genesis, are 24 hours each, they contain Kol uh, Yiman Alom, all the ages and all the secrets of the world. Now, Kamaiides says there's only one physical creation, and that creation was a tiny speck. And in that speck, all the raw material that should be used for making everything else. And this speck expanded out, this substance, so thin that it has no essence, turned into matter as we know it. The moment that matter formed from the substance of the universe, time grabs hold. Einstein's E equals MC squared tells us that energy can change into matter. Once it changes into matter, time grabs hold. This moment of time, before the clock begins, the Bible lasted one one hundred thousandth of a second, minuscule time. But in that time, the universe expanded from a tiny speck about the size of the solar system. From that moment, we have matter, and time flows outward. Now, what the hell does that mean? Schroeder is connecting the modern um, concept of origins with the Kabbalah, claiming that the Nicomaides and others created the Big Bang Theory in the, in the medieval world and even before then. The Kabbalah, therefore, is considered a fully scientific set of beliefs. This isn't science, of course, but it's pagan Jewish speculation. The Big Bang Theory was taken directly from the earlier writings of the Kabbalah. Isaac Luria promoted the Big Bang idea in the same way Nicomaides did in the 13th century. Uh, people like, um, I really should say like uh, Ben Hakana, um, speculated that the age of the universe was 15 billion years. Wait, a minute. Isaac Laurie, of course, is a is a um, is a Renaissance figure. Um, but Ben Hakana, starting at the High Middle Ages, uh, fifteen billion years. Sorry about that. Using purely speculative theories from mysticism, and they're not shy about saying that they prophesized the Big Bang four hundred years before it was accepted as truth. He says. Although Nicomaides understood that the heliocentricity model was the required first step in the road to legitimizing a relativistic Big Bang expanding universe, cosmological fantasy which would establish eons of evolution and destroy all credibility in the Bible, he didn't have the mathematical mechanism that, I'm sorry, this, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't, uh, Schroeder. Um, this is, um, uh, actually this is an amateur, the one who, who I find very interesting. Um, Gloria was the right man at the right place at the right time, dying in 1572, to declare something like the, the Kabbalistic inner sanctum. Now we have the mechanism that could make the cosmology of the sages work. Much the same way, 300 years later, Karl Marx could write to LaSalle that Darwin's book had given the death blow to God and further exalt Darwin's book serves me as a basis for the class struggle in history. Well, whether it be from Schroeder or anyone else, um, the understanding here is what Schroeder is saying, that modern uh, cosmology comes from the Kabbalah. It comes from Nicomaides and others, and even earlier than him, Ben Hakana and Luria, who used the Big Bang Theory um, and created it, that now becomes day-to-day, not, not string theory and other things, that now is taken as scientific reality. And this is where Schroeder says, on a regular basis, that Jews created modern science, theologically speaking. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that you have legitimate amateurs, myself included, that are reacting to this kind of thing. That are saying that the professionals in this field are so insulated 
because I use a very technical vocabulary, because we just don't know the inner workings of the science. But when you come across something like this, um, it's a bit of an issue. They're revolting against specialists who really aren't examined very closely. This is what Socrates was always trying to do. One of these revolts is the flat earth. Now I have a few friends that accept this idea. I'm not making fun of you. I understand that that the, the reaction against the scientific establishment is a serious one. And they deserve it. But I do believe that it's a detriment to creationists everywhere. I am sick and tired of getting into debates with people where they throw me in with the flat earth people. Um, and the creationists, or those who believe in even a young earth, like me, are thrown in with these guys. The flat earth idea is destroying the gains that the creationist movement has made over the last few decades, as, as meager as they are. In terms of creationism, even young earth stuff, you have specialists, tremendous body of scientific work uh, by specialists, by scientists at the top of their field, that now has accumulated to such a degree that evolutionary mythology is on the defensive. That's a pretty substantial gain for creationism. The flat earth threatens to destroy this. Um, the material I've written, uh, sorry, I've, I've read on the, on the flat earth idea is generally pretty low brown. They don't understand the academic jargon or the theory. The idea that gravity is a myth, the sun is far closer than previously believed, and things like this, the sky is a glass dome, this kind of thing. You know, it's a problem. It's not to say that that you shouldn't be suspicious of groups like NASA. I never cared about the moon landing stuff. That was never an issue for me. I wasn't an expert in the area. I didn't want to talk about, I didn't want to fall into my own anathema, in other words. But then I came across Stanley Kubrick in his old age, admitted that he filmed the moon landing. It was a confession in a video that was to be released only upon his death. I've seen the video, and he says, and I quote, The moon landings were fakes. They all were fake. And I was the person who filmed it. The conspiracy theorists were right on this occasion. Then he said a massive fraud, an unprecedented fraud, was perpetuated against the people. It is Faustian to be sure. And he said that it bothered him throughout his career, and his career was made in part by his cooperative attitude in creating this production. He said explicitly in the, uh, which is, you know, the video is available, um, that his freedom in Hollywood was a direct result of him doing this. He said he drank a lot because he felt terrible about it. But he also considered it his masterpiece because the fraud was so successful. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to, claim to make any scientific arguments in this respect. Again, although scientists make arguments in my field all the time, I'm not going to return the favor. But Kubrick put the final nail in the coffin. Why in heaven's name is this man going to lie? On his deathbed, saying that his career in Hollywood was made possible because he, 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 he filmed the fake moon land. Why would he do this? He wasn't drunk. He wasn't slurring. He was perfectly coherent. He was obviously very sick. And I've noticed it's been scrubbed from everywhere except uh, Vimeo. It's the only place I could find it now. So when a deathbed confession from a legend like Stanley Kubrick gets scrubbed from all but almost all video channels, someone is upset. Now, yeah, again, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into the issue at all, one way or the other. And I never really cared much about it until I listened to Kubrick talking like this. It's kind of like people who, who, when they hear Bob Dylan for the first time in 60 minutes, saying that he made a deal with Satan. He comes right out and says it. You know, again, he's near the end of his life, end of his career. Every once in a while, you come across one of these guys who say it. Michael Jackson said it not about himself, but about others. You know, it's a myth that conspiracies require the cooperation of thousands of people 
over decades, which of course is impossible. That's not necessary. People have been blowing the whistle on JFK, 9-11, NASA for decades. Often very well qualified people, not amateurs, without serious media coverage. Whistleblowers are everywhere. They come in all shapes and sizes. But without media attention, without consideration from elites, it doesn't exist. And conspiracies are, this is how powerful people work. Political science and history is about uncovering conspiracies. We don't, we don't listen to official pronouncements from governments. The whole point of this field is to break through that and to understand how power relationships work. That's called conspiracy. Powerful people work in secret. History is driven by these powerful entities. And our purpose is to, un- is to uncover it. Large conspiracies are expensive and difficult, but they do not require the silence of thousands of people. Now, some of you have come across the fake Mars photos, the ice on Pluto, the Devon Island hoax was accepted by NASA for a while, but now they warn people as a matter of damage control, saying, well, this is, this isn't, this isn't real. Now, the Egyptian desert picture, that's another matter. Both were put forth as the so-called surface of Mars not too long ago. Um, NASA engineer uh, Kelly Smith explained in 2014 that the Orion Deep Space mission to Mars can't work until they figure out how to get past, get past the Van Allen belts, as I mentioned already. Another one is uh, Dr. Ellen uh, uh, Stolfan, one of NASA's chief scientists and principal advisor to the NASA administration. 2014, she said, NASA's focus now is on sending humans beyond low Earth orbit to Mars. We're trying to develop the technologies to get there. It's actually a huge technological challenge. There are a couple of really big issues. For one thing, radiation. Once you get outside the Earth's magnetic field, we're going to be exposing the astronauts to not just radiation coming from the sun, but cosmic radiation. That's a higher dose than we think humans right now should ever really get. Sometimes I really wonder, was she aware of the implications of that statement? I mentioned that the Russian claim uh, I came across, it was um, Dr. E.E. E. Uh, Kovalev in his Radiation Protection During Space Flight. That's from the Institute of Biomedical Problems from the USSR Ministry of Health. He is the one who said some time ago that they abandoned the the moon uh, program because they can't create a craft that's made of lead. Only a massive lead shield would permit anything to pass through the belt. Uh, and this is exactly what what um, Dr. Ellen Stolfan is making reference to, Kelly Smith and many others. What they're making reference to there is um is something of 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 a tremendous extremity now with all that i get to the flat earth idea it takes legitimate skepticism and takes it too far i remember when this first came out it, it's it's only a few years old flat earth theory got a lot of mainstream attention very quickly um NBA star uh, Kyrie Irving, a couple of rappers, a few other minor celebrities, kind of came out all at once spouting this idea, and it's very suspicious. The movement came out of nowhere maybe a decade ago, gets immediate traction in popular culture, and is then used to beat creationists over the head with. This view should explode onto the scene with celebrity endorsers is strange. It sounds like an intellectual false flag. See, young Earth scientists are actually scientists, but they've been working in obscurity for years. But somehow, the flat Earth idea gets mainstream appeal almost immediately, and Google doesn't filter out its results, like it does for any other non-PC idea. Here's the problem. These people believe that prior to 1492, People thought the Earth was flat, and they used the myth of Christopher Columbus, Colum- Christopher Columbus to to back that up. No one in the Middle Ages thought the Earth was flat. Nobody. 
The myth began in the polemics between Protestants and Catholics in Great Britain long after the Middle Ages had, had come and gone. John William Draper wrote The History of Conflict Between Science and Religion in 1874, asserted that myth without any attribution whatsoever. The flat earth, then as now, was just a stick to beat Christians over the head with um, during the debates over Darwinism. Like these debates, all of a sudden, these signs of scientific rigor and mathematical precision invent positions, red herrings, a logic to beat their opponents with. They do it all the time. In the polemical works pitting religion against science, so-called, writers like Draper, uh, Andrew White, or Camille Flammarion, state that the early church fathers, quote-unquote, thought that the earth was flat, but just in a, in a, to what discredit them. But none of the church fathers taught this doctrine, despite publishing many works on scientific topics. Hexammer on and St. Basil's just one. St. Ambrose has one too. But these guys haven't read these guys, so they can't say otherwise. But I have read these guys. James Hannam wrote this. The myth that people in the Middle Ages thought the earth is flat appears to date only from the 17th century as a part of the campaign by Protestants against Catholic teaching. It gained currency in the 19th century thanks to inaccurate histories such as John Draper's History of the Conflict Between Science and Religion, as I mentioned before, and Andrew Dixon's Andrew Dixon White's History of Warfare of Science with Theology and Christendom, which came out in 1896. Atheists and agnostics championed the conflict thesis for their own purposes, but historical research gradually demonstrated that Draper and White had propagated more fantasy than fact in their efforts to prove that science and religion are locked in eternal conflict. In other words, these writers, whether it be White, Draper, Flammarion, um, invented the notion that medievals believed the world, the, the earth was flat. They did not. Even in Thomas Jefferson, in his notes on Virginia, perpetuates the myth that the debates in Rome between Galileo and the papacy were over the roundness of the earth. He says, government is just as infallible too when it fixes systems in physics. Galileo was sent to the Inquisition for affirming that the earth was a sphere. The government had declared it to be flat as a trencher, uh, sorry, flat as a trencher, and Galileo was obliged to abjure his error. Now, I wonder what you think about Jefferson. That is a ridiculous statement. No one in Rome believed the earth was flat. And in fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone in history who believed it. At any time. The voyages of Columbus had no relation to the flatness of the earth. No one brought this issue up at the time. The main concerns, as my listeners certainly know, the precise location of Asia, to test the endurance of ships to sail safely um, at that distance. Searching for raw materials in new markets, of course, but that was the main reason behind the voyages. Even something as simple as, as, as where the term Indian came from. Columbus didn't call the natives Indians because he thought he was an Indian. Because India was called Hindustan at the time. Indian was a general term for native. People still do that today. Indians are or a native group of people you don't, know, you don't know anything about. You meet them for the first time, that's what they're called. That's typical for popular wisdom, though. There's not much there. But what strikes me is that people who are arguing for the, the Enlightenment nominalist position, the uh, so-called scientific position, when they're attacking religion, and by that they mean Christianity, they use the most polemical and non-scientific methods to do it. Um... The anti-clerical writers, um, Antoine uh, uh, Jean Latron, uh, Jean Baptiste Grail, um, uh, Idia Mantella, all these people argue that the earth, I thought they all argue that the myth that the Middle Ages were a profound night, they said, for humanity, where ignorance ruled supreme. Uh, Latron even wrote on his, on the cosmological significance of the church fathers. He wrote this whole thing without citing a single one. He never read them, and he figured his audience didn't either. You write an entire paper, or a brief book, on the Church Fathers from the point of view of the Enlightenment, and you don't quote a single one. It's like the phrase trickle-down economics, or managed democracy. Flat Earth was always an insult, and it was never a serious scientific point of view. 
trickle-down economics was an insult used by Walter Mondale in the 1984 presidential debates. No one ever claimed that was a name of the supply side view. For, you know, true or false, that was never the, that, they never claimed, they never claimed trickle down, that was never the issue. It was an insult that over time began to be associated with that school. So you have people who really believe that the supply, the Reaganite types really think that we get, get their rich, richer, and it will trickle down to everyone else. They don't believe this. But because of that one insult in the 84 debates, it's now called trickle-down economics. Managed democracy. That was a phrase that was created by Madeleine Albright concerning Yugoslavia. That the U.S. colonial administration in places like Kosovo and elsewhere is going to manage their democracy so it all comes out right. Somehow that's been uh, ascribed to Vladimir Putin. In fact, there's been several papers with that in the title. That was Madeleine Albright who came up with that. But this is what happens. Over time, these either insults, these negative ideas, somehow become associated as if they really believe them. Edward Grant is another one. Uh, he argued that the myth of the flat earth developed as a dishonest attack on the Middle Ages. Um, and of course, people like uh, Francesco Petrarch is one of the big culprits, and it became stock in trade for the Gnostics in the Renaissance. The flat earth idea was a product of the polemical tracts of the time, and never a scientific idea in its own right. The polemical nature of these so-called debates, the scientific party, so to speak, they would say anything to humiliate the scholastics or the patristic consensus. And frankly, these people knew very little about them. And they usually couldn't even define those terms. It's the height of irony when someone arguing for the rigorous, unemotional, and mechanical logic of positivism will hysterically call his opponents' names. Everything medieval was backward, so any insult will be believed, because everyone knows it's true. Moderns need to believe that everything before it is darkness and ignorance. And so that's where they begin to perpetuate the flat earth mythology. As things were so hard in the past, Massive sacrifices forced upon us now in the name of progress are well worth it. In grad school, I spent a lot of time in, on Aristotle. And he proved the earth was round in On the Heavens, part 13, section 3. That means both the Islamic and Christian worlds rejected the flat earth idea. So it never took root anywhere. Now, it's true. If you, if you try to find somebody in history who believes in the flat earth, Aristotle claims that Anaxagoras, um, uh, Anaxagoras and, and Democritus uh, believed in it. Anaximenes, I should say. But these were the people who believed in, in a flat earth. I'm not sure it's right. He doesn't cite anything that a lot of their works don't survive in this respect. But the only reason that they said the earth was flat is that they were arguing for the fact that it's immobile. If it's flat, it's sort of like um, the wind can't move a flat surface because there's so little surface for it to push. That was where the word came from, from those guys. But even there, they weren't making a strictly scientific argument. Aristotle said that different constellations are visible from different latitudes. So the Big Dipper is visible at, at 41 degrees north or higher, always visible there. Below 25 degrees south, you can't see it. So just north of that, let's say in northern Australia, the Big Dipper can't be seen. You have to go to the Caribbean to see the Southern Cross. It only makes sense if the Earth were a globe. And the, the Aristotle also noticed that the Earth's shadow and the moon was curved during an eclipse. Most of the promoters of this theory have no idea Aristotle was capable of such deductions, but I've never read him before. And Erastenes, uh, his experimentation, which was crude, is true, uh, very little known, but it's very famous, you know, on high noon, June 21st, he put a stick in Alexandria, and then it cast it a, a much greater shadow than uh, Juan at Aswan, or Syene at the time, in the Upper Nile. Well, at high noon, on June 21st, that's impossible unless the Earth is round. The sun was far enough away that its rays would be parallel by the time they got to the Earth. 
In fact, the curve between the two places were about 7 degrees. So you have flat earth people who claim the sun therefore is much closer than it really is, than, than believed, uh, to get around this, this problem. And Aristosthenes actually hired a guy to pace out the distance between the two cities and place the stick in the same day at the same time. So nothing was left to chance. It's about 800 kilometers, or, you know, 5,000 stadia at the time. Given 7 degrees against 360, he correctly figured the full circumference of the Earth, off only by a tiny margin, about 40,000 kilometers, ultimately. The Flat Earth Society was the creation of 19th century um, polemics. It took nothing from the Middle Ages. And if you read the Zetic Astronomy Journal, first published in 1881, really, it's it's... You know, debunking some of the more obvious proofs that the Earth is curved. You know, and I'm not going to get into this to, to, to a great extent, but some of it was a tongue in cheek. Some of it was meant to be a joke. This is the problem. I'm not going to get into any technical argument about um, uh, the curvature of the Earth, or any technical about whether it be Aristotle or modern ideas or anything else. The problem is that where you have professionals in a highly technical field like, like astrophysics who are insulated, who hide behind a very technical vocabulary and impressive mathematics, it's very difficult for laymen to penetrate that world. Laymen like myself. Amateurs are revolting against so many of their ideological claims. The whole notion of the, the textbook pictures and I, I didn't understand that. I didn't realize that until you know last decade that those pictures aren't real. They're computer generated. Well, why? I went to the um, in 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 college. Uh, we went to the um, the Middletown Connecticut Observatory, the Van Vleck Observatory, and. They have the, the 24 inch telescope there. This is a gigantic thing. And I looked through that and I saw Saturn at full magnification. It was a white blob. It looked nothing like what we see in our textbook. It was a white blob. I could hardly tell that apart from anything else. And this is at the Van Vleck Observatory. This is a gigantic, it's the biggest, um, I think the biggest telescope in New England. Those images in our textbook were CGI. And my professor confirmed it. And he said, and I quote, no one has any idea what they look like. And he's referring to like galaxies and, and these distant stars and everything else. Saturn was a blob. And that struck me that there was something wrong here. Now there's bigger telescopes and everything else, but it doesn't, it doesn't get much better than that. It doesn't get much better than this. I understand where the flat earth people are coming from. They're at war with the intensely corrupt scientific establishment in this regard. It's a visceral reaction against the, the authoritarianism of the scientific establishment. It's a reaction against the fact that this establishment believes in dogma, not observation. And it's in their professional, personal, and financial interest to do so. However, while understandable, it does real harm. The historical truth is that the flat earth theory was never taken seriously at any time in history. The ancients, east and west, argued for the globe. The patristic church did the same. Islam, because the science came from the Greeks, did the same. It came from, the flat earth idea came from 19th century polemics against Catholicism which they connect with both scholasticism and the Church Fathers. That's where it came from. So now I get in debates with evolutionists who now claim that I must be a flat earther because I believe in creationism or even the young earth idea. The flat earth idea, unfortunately, creates is exists, exists only to destroy creationism. It's now a cudgel to hit us over the head with. And that may explain why it came out of nowhere ten years ago with celebrity endorsers and mainstream appeal. Not that anyone, you know, any scientist believes it. They don't. But 
Uh, creationism isn't like that. It didn't come ready-made a decade ago. It was suspicious and continues to be. I understand the reaction against these people. I get it. And I actually have some good insights in, on other t- topics. Their websites actually can be very good on other issues. The CGI stuff, some of it comes from them. But not only from them. But it's false. And the notion of the amateur in the, in the true sense um, is is the cause. Amateurs like me, when I'm talking about um, this kind of stuff, we have a role to play. We're, we're throwing a monkey wrench in their in their in their system. But we don't claim to be professionals. We don't claim to be experts. We do what Socrates did. We don't claim any knowledge. We just ask very inconvenient questions, and that's what we're doing here. It's a very suspicious doctrine. And as creationism it has really thrown uh, the irreducible clusters idea and things like that have really thrown um, the evolutionary mythology uh, on the defensive. And they have been very much on the defensive. All of a sudden, flat earth ideology comes into existence and is now being used to beat us over the head with. It's suspicious and it's false. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Donate to Father Matt Johnson at RussJournal.org. RUSJournal.org.